another uh, but uh, okay and j just another thing for people to understand it a bit better so <laughs> in one of your papers i don't have the title here with me but you talk about the mind or these adaptations as evolved crib shit so yeah. uh, <laughs> that you say that that in in, in a sense when we're born or we already have these innate mechanisms that know the, uh, the problems we're going to deal with and yes. already have some sort of information about how yes. to deal yes. with them, right? Yes. In, in, in the United States, a crib sheet is if you're taking an exam and you're cheating on the exam and you've written the answers on a piece of, sheet, on a piece of paper, um, that's the crib sheet. <laughs> It has answers already. Um, so, so yeah, that, the idea is that these mechanisms, um, these adaptations themselves are supplying uh, answers to, um, uh, supplying information about many aspects of the world. Like, uh, nobody has to tell me that you have thoughts, that you have mental representations, that you have desires, beliefs, intentions. I... Uh, my mind assumes that automatically by virtue of having classified you as a, a human and an agent. Uh, um, uh, the same for many other domains. Um, you could have, so in reasoning about social exchange, there are lots of inferences that we make spontaneously. Like if I say, so you can actually, one of our former graduate students, professor of anthropology now, uh, Larry Sugiyama, he was traveling in Peru, and he, uh, with uh, Yora people, who speak Yora. <laughs> and Larry didn't, he spoke Spanish, but not Yora. And he wanted to make a trade, and he had a knife, and the other guy had chickens. And so Larry was able to say, one knife, two chickens. And the guy agrees, but then he starts to give Larry one chicken, and Larry says, no, one knife, two chickens, and then they, they trade. But think about it. That's such a impoverished communication, right? One knife, two chickens. Uh, but they understand everything from that. They, each person understands that if if you if if I give him the knife, if I give him the knife, then he's obligated to give me two chickens. If he doesn't give me two chickens, I'm not obligated to give him the knife. If I give him the knife, I'm entitled to two chickens, not one chicken. <laughs> that if he doesn't give me the two chickens after, after agreeing to this, then he will have cheated me, et cetera. And the other guy will understand that Larry, if he doesn't give him the knife, but he takes the chickens, will have cheated him. And they all understand <clears throat> the mutual, the set of mutual obligations and entitlements that are implicit in saying one knife, two chickens, and agreeing to that, um, even though, because because their their social exchange algorithms are supplying all those inferences for free. And those inferences don't come naturally out of any domain general first order logic, for example. They're, they 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 aren't the same inferences that you, if, if all you had in your head was a little, a little module that did nothing but apply rules from logic like modus ponens and modus tollens. Yeah. Modus ponens is if I say if P then Q is true, P is true, therefore Q is true. That would be modus ponens. If we only had a little module that did that and that was our only inference system, um, you wouldn't make those same inferences. It, you, would, you would make different inferences. So those inferences are supplied by some specialized machinery. And that allows us to engage in this crazy thing of exchange which is so hypertrophied in humans, I mean, that it's, you, you find reciprocation in various other species, but the extent to which we engage in exchange for any number of different goods and services, an unlimited array of goods and services, is something very peculiar to our species and kind of amazing. Um, but yes, the, the, the supplying those differences is what I mean by that, that would be a part of the evolved crib sheet. Larry, Larry, and the then the Yora guy he was exchanging with, they both had the same crib sheet, and so they both understood the interaction completely. Um. Yeah, and the, another thing that, and this is one one of the points related to evolutionary psychology, where people most usually disconnect from things and get angry about the explanations that are behind. behind what angry? Uh, behind, sorry. What people get angry? 
No, I'm just kidding. No, yes, no, 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 yes, no, I've got no, a no, yes, no, no, that, that never happens. Never. <laughs> <laughs> in the, in the, but uh, I mean, the distinction between ultimate and proximate oh, explanations, yes. because right. this is one of the points where people usually right. get angry about, oh, right. so you do that because you want to reproduce. Oh, no, I don't want to reproduce. I just want to whatever. Yes. Right. No, I know. Yes, yes. And the ultimate explanation is the, 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 the problem that the mechanism was designed to solve, the selection pressures that led to its design. The mechanism itself, let me use, since it's Mother's Day, <laughs> since it's Mother's Day, <laughs> let me use the example of maternal love. Um, you can get technical about maternal love. You can talk about an attachment system. You can talk about um, a motivational system that causes you to want to keep your offspring close to you, to feed them, to make sure they're healthy, to, um, uh, to protect them from predators, to protect them from other people, to help them engage with the world. You don't love your children to spread your genes. You don't have a desire to spread your genes. There's no re mental representation of genes. Genes is a modern concept that it's like, you know, what, a little over 100 years old. It's, it's, the, 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 there, is no, there is no motivation to spread your genes. There is a motivational system that, that has the effect of causing you to want to take care of your offspring and see them flourish. And it has many very specific properties to it. Our ancestors, those who had that system that I'll call, I'll call that motivational system maternal love, had more offspring than mothers whose motivational systems caused them to neglect their offspring. So you have selection for alternative designs. The, the selection for maternal neglect got outcompeted by selection for maternal love. That's because that's how natural section works. Design features, features of, of our phenotype, whether it's a cognitive mechanism or whether it's fingers or, or elbows or knees, they, are, they have effects on their own reproduction in a population. And those that promote their own reproduction relative to alternative designs are the ones that spread, and those are the ones that become universal and species typical. So I don't love my daughter because I want to spread my genes, <laughs> right? Um, it's, that's, that's, that's the wrong way to think about it. And it's a not wrong way to think about it actually also it's the wrong way to think about it when you're thinking about the gene as a unit of selection because whatever genes participate in creating that that motivational system they they they, they promoted their own reproduction because of the effects on 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 survival of offspring and it doesn't matter that i also have genes for knees and genes for eyes the, the genes underlying other parts of my phenotype are irrelevant to it. Um, in fact, there are cases, well, it's not that I'm trying to spread my genome, my whole set of genes. My whole set of genes is irrelevant. I never spread my, I never spread my whole set of genes because I don't clone. I'm not an yeah. asexual organism. A random, half of my genes were randomly chosen as gametes were formed, and they were jammed together with a random set of John's genes to produce our, our daughter. Um, my genome is not replicated. P particular chromosomes went into, uh, from me and from him, went into making her, but the genome is not, it's, not like, it's like there is no motivation to spread your genome. There's no motivation to spread your genes per se. Does, does my eye have a motivation to spread its genes? No. My eye, my, my eye has the features that it does. Does my cornea? Does, does the pupil? The, all of those features are there because those features promoted the, the, their own reproduction better than alternative features. Um, and that's true for every single component of, 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 of our species typical design, all of it, not just behavior. Um, so 
The proximate mechanism refers to the actual adaptation. The ultimate explanation has to do with why it's there, why it was selected. And this is actually, you know, we were talking about um, sociobiology versus evolutionary psychology. <clears throat> In sociobiology, people were so excited about these theories of selection pressures, um, uh, especially about social behavior, that some people got a little bit confused, in my, in my opinion, um, about the ultimate proximate distinction. They, they would valorize um, ultimate explanations and sort of denigrate proximate explanations. But if you think about it, uh, Darwin's theory is a theory of phenotypes. It's a theory about why do organisms have the properties that they do. Why do the finches have beaks, uh, different beaks on the different islands of the Galapagos? You're, you're trying to understand why there are some proximate, me proximate mechanisms rather than others, why there's some adaptations rather than others. And theories about selection pressures are theories about that. So if there is no Darwinism without adaptations, because with, that, that, that's what natural selection is an explanation of. It is the, adaptations are the thing to be explained. They're the explanandum. Natural selection is, is the explanation of adaptation. So you can't have a, 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 a truly Darwinian theory of humans or any other organism without reference to adaptations. And so that's one of the reasons you can't just go from selection pressures to behavior. There are adaptations that were selected for because they produce some kinds of behaviors rather than other behaviors. And you're, you're, you're missing that crucial level of explanation if you, if you ignore the adaptation. So, um, yes. It's yeah, not yeah. to spread your, yeah, it's not to, so people would sometimes, and, and you can sometimes see this, occasionally you could even see this with evolutionary biologists, and I think it's because our theory of mind mechanism is so powerful that we think of behavior as caused by beliefs and desires. It's just like in economics, they, they, they use the, that folk theory and they say, well, you have beliefs about how the world is and then you have a desire to make money and that explains why you make the choices that you do. I mean, I'm saying very, very kernel, I'm not, I mean, economics is a very elegant science. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not disputing that, but that, that's kind of the folk theory that economists work from, um, even though it's not part of their axiomatized uh, theory. Uh, some evolutionary biologists who just inserted into that desire slot about what you want, instead of money, instead of maximizing payoffs in terms of money, they substitute maximizing fitness or maximizing number of offspring. But it, that's a very blank slate view. It's the view of the mind as a general purpose information processing device where it has a goal maximize number of offspring, and it'll figure out, no matter what circumstance it's in, how, what course of action will produce the most offspring. That's an incorrect view, I would argue, of, of the human mind. And not just incorrect, it's impossible. It's computationally impossible. You, you, can't make a, you can't make a computational device that will do that. It would require parallel lives, evaluating different universes, evaluating alternative courses of action in all their combinations to figure out what's most likely to produce the most offspring. It's using a criterion that's in the far future to decide what I'm doing. It, so it can lead you to ask what I view as kooky questions if you make that mistake. So you might ask questions like, or you might propose explanations of, you might say, oh, well, there's there were celibate monks in monasteries. Why? Oh, maybe they're, even though they're celibate, maybe they're actually maximizing their reproductive success or their inclusive fitness because they're helping their siblings. And that's why they're monks. Maybe they're helping their siblings, maybe they're not helping their siblings, but that's not an explanation for being a monk. Right? That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's based on, on the theory that your mind is, is, that you have this desire to maximize number of offspring, and whatever situation you're in, that must be the explanation of whatever you do. 
it's to max is to maximize the number of offspring. From that point of view, you would also be puzzled by why are men not lined up around the block at sperm banks, ready to make deposits at sperm banks? You know, wh- wh- you know, why, why, why are people ever using contraception? It makes no sense. If that's how you think the the mind works, none of those things make sense. On the other hand, if you think, okay, we have mechanisms that make us enjoy sex, like other organisms do, and we have those mechanisms because they had the effect, they had the consequence of producing offspring better than mechanisms that would make you hate to have sex. And that's why we have those mechanisms, but it's, you don't have sex, you have sex because you enjoy the sex. I mean, that because of the adaptations you have, not because you're trying to have the maximum number of your genes in your genome be in the next generation. It's, I, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but there's the two errors, the not understanding the proximate mechanism that's being designed by natural selection and treating the genome as a whole as opposed to that a gene promo- solves problems that promote its own reproduction. Mm-hmm. There are cases that where your genome doesn't all agree, by the way. So if you're, so for example, um, there are the mosquitoes that carry yellow fever. They sometimes, the males have a, a mutation called the driving Y chromosome. And the driving Y chromosome, it you know, normally the Y chromosome puts itself into half of the gam- at half of the sperm. The driving Y, it's a s- segregation distorter. It, instead of putting itself into half of the sperm, it puts itself into all sperm. That means that any male with that driving Y has only sons. And since their sons have inher- inherited the driving Y chromosome, they have only sons. And their sons have only sons. Until so the whole population becomes male and it collapses. Okay. Um, uh, now, that driving right chromosome it promotes its own reproduction. It's not necessarily doing anything that's beneficial for the other genes in the mosquito, the genes that code for other aspects of the mosquito's phenotype. It's something that promotes its own reproduction, even though that um, doesn't help at all, <laughs> all, the other, all the other genes in the genome. Our mitochondrial genes are that way. They come. You're, you're, you're a dead end for your mother's mitochondrial genes. Uh, every 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 son is a dead end for the mitochondrial genes or any extra nuclear gene because he's not going to pass them on. Um, only daughters pass on the mitochondrial genes. That means that if you're going to have a, a a mutation that changes the sex ratio. Uh, if it's in a cytoplasmic gene, an extra, a, an extra nuclear gene, it's going to promote its reproduction best if it codes for daughters. Rather, than, But that's not necessarily good for the nuclear genes. Nuclear genes are not spread only by daughters. They're spread by daughters and, and sons. And so you could find, um, you can find cases of conflict within the genome in various species uh, where, like you can find this in certain species of corn, where you, you, you have uh, cytoplasmically inherited genes that are um, causing only daughters to be produced, and then there'll be a mutation on the nuclear part of the genome that suppresses that, and produces sons again, and then there'll be a counter mutation on the sort of, and, and it's wildly swinging sex ratios, and so we barely hang together. Um, and, <laughs> and, um, so, yes. That's why all of that is why you have to keep the ultimate approximate explanations completely separate. And you're right, that is one thing where people get confused about that and it, and it makes them very angry. My father got very angry when I first started to learn this stuff. My father, my father. I came home from college with my sophomore year and I had the selfish gene. And, and I was trying to tell my parents about sociobiology and the gene is a unit of selection. And my father looks at me and he says, I think he, he may have even picked up the book. I can't remember if he threw across the room or if that's just an elaboration that my imagination has. <laughs> but he says, he says, I don't give a damn about my genes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? 
He said, if somebody told me tomorrow that you're not my biological daughter, I would still love you just as much. I don't give a damn about my genes. I thought he was being unreasonable at the time, but actually he was correct. <laughs> he doesn't love me because I carry his genes. He has paternal love because of an ancestral process that selected for maternal love because of its effect on the replication of genes for paternal love. Um, so my dad was correct when he said that. Um, but it was a common way that people uh, misinterpreted um, what all of this is about. Yeah, exactly. And I think that one of the main reasons why people look at the explanations that come from evolutionary psychology and then say, oh, they are just, oh, uh, just so stories, right? Is because, uh, I mean, most of the things that go around in our mind are subconscious, right? And most of the things that influence our yeah. behavior and our decisions operate at a subconscious level. And so, <laughs> and so even now and then when I have discussions with people about, about these things and we're talking about, oh, men usually on average choose women that have these characteristics and men, we, and women, men that have those characteristics and so on. Uh, uh, all the time someone comes and, and says something like, oh, so you're saying that because that all, all men choose women because they have neotenous facial traits and waist width ratio of 0.7 and clear skin and so on. Uh, uh, and I have to be honest, sometimes I, 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 I troll them a bit and say, oh, you know, you, you, you know, uh, that really... Uh, you know, you're talking about the case of your cousin Bob, who's married to a woman who, with square chin, large shoulders, big belly, and burps all the time. But you know, my great grandmother uh, uh, only ate potatoes and beans, but because she didn't have access to cake and steak, so perhaps if your cousin Bob. <laughs> was higher on the year on the male hierarchy, perhaps you he, he could try a shot at Jennifer Lawrence or so. <laughs> you are trolling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I, I'm trolling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's it, you know actually um, yes, most of what goes on in your mind is not even capable of becoming conscious. But, you know, one of my students said about just those stories and adaptationism is yes. An adaptationist explanation is just so. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's just so. Um, it's an expression in English. It's just so when it's just perfect. Um, but a just so story is another word for an explanation. Science is supposed to provide explanations. I could say, look. Why, why? I, go, I know pens drop when I let them go. Isaac Newton knew that apples would fall from the tree. What's this universal theory of gravitation? That's a just so story for something we already all know. We all know that things drop. Right? Yes, it's called an explanation. <laughs> Theories <laughs> provide explanations for phenomena. Um, it's like people, often in psychology, people will say, some people will say, well, I don't want to know something if my grandmother could have told it to me. Um, no, I want to study something if my grandmother could have told it to me. <laughs> if there's something that's so common and so universal and so frequent as a kind of behavior that even your grandmother knew, um, probably there are really interesting, complex adaptations that are giving rise to that behavior. Um, you know, you don't want to just study the things that um, are unpredicted or strange. Um, so, obviously, it's always fine to go from some description of, of the phenotype, like an eyeball, and try to understand why it was designed the way it, it is, an, an, an evolutionary explanation for it, its design. That's always okay. That's what people usually mean when they say a just-so story. You're taking a mechanism that already is known to exist and trying to understand it. But 
you can also, what we've done is usually go in the opposite direction, is take theories about problems, ancestral adaptive problems, and use them to develop hypotheses about things that nobody knows exists. Um, so, I mean, it can't be a post hoc explanation if nobody knew the thing existed before. And I, I would say that I would say that even if you know everything about how a mechanism works, you are still not understanding fundamental things about it if you don't know what it's for. Can I show you? Some, it'll take me a minute to just get it out of my bag. Can I show you something? To, I want to. I want to show you an example. So lots of times, a lot of psychologists, neuroscientists say this a lot, you know, they'll say, well, if I know about the dopamine receptors and the serotonin receptors, if I know these things, why do I need to know anything about what the mechanism is for? Okay, see this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I claim that you see everything about how this mechanism works pretty much. You looking at it? Where do I, where do I hold it? Okay. It's not hard to see the mechanism. What's it for? I'm not sure, but perhaps to grab something. Uh, that, that is it, of the uh, same diameter as... Y y yes, but... Yes, but to what end? Oh, to what end? Yeah, yeah. Yes, the, why, does this, why does this exist? <laughs> why, why did somebody go to the trouble of manufacturing this? Okay, here's, things, uh, here's things that it's not for. It's not for making carrots have ridges on them. It's the wrong diameter. It's not for pulling corks out of bottles. Again, the diameter is wrong. Um, it's not, my students always think it's some strange sexual device. It's not that. Um, that would be painful. Uh, if I tell you, the question is, if I tell you what this is for, tell me if you then understand more about it. This is, you know how some people eat soft boiled eggs, they put it in a cup, the egg, the soft -boiled egg, and then you want to take the top off the soft boiled egg so that you can eat it with a spoon. Mm -hmm. That's what this is for. This is to put on the top of the chicken egg, not an ostrich egg shell, not a quail egg shell, a chicken egg, and, the, and to pull off that top so you can eat the soft boiled egg inside. Now, when you know that, you know why, the, it's, why it's circular. You know why it has this particular diameter and not others. You know why these are sharp. You know why these are only, they're only about a quarter of an inch, like a half centimeter, uh, maybe less. Well, about a half centimeter long, because it only needs to go through the shell. It doesn't need to go farther than the shell. Um, you know why it has things for the fingers. Uh, that, that you probably knew from your experience of scissors. You also know why it's made of metal because it needs to be hard enough to go through the shell. You also know that the fact that the metal is silver is a byproduct of its design. It's not, it's not crucial to its design. It could be painted any color and it would still accomplish that function. Um, you know about the design, that why this is like this is. I would claim that even though you knew every single part of this before, before I told you what it was for, that you're, you have a richer, deeper understanding of it now that you know what it's for because you understand why each part is there and which parts are crucial to its design and which parts are not. And I think that's true for any, any um, part of an organism's phenotype or a collection of mechanisms like this. Um, and for any one of them, even if you know everything about how it works, which you probably don't for any of them, but even if you did, there's an added layer of understanding of which parts are there because they solved a problem and which parts are arbitrary that you get when you understand what it's for. And if I told you 
hey, would it be nice to have uh, a little device that takes the top off of soft boiled eggs really easily? Um, you might well design something like this uh, that has various properties like that. And so if, if I told you, you know what, it, amongst all those kitchen implements, I bet you there's one that takes the top off of soft boiled eggs that has that function, you would probably, seeing all those kitchen implements, pick this one out. You would look for it. You would look for something with these kinds of design features. And that's what evolutionary psychology does for you as a researcher. It tells you that there's likely to be something, a mechanism that solves a particular problem in, in our brains and, and what features it's likely to have so that you can then conduct experiments to look for them. Exactly. And so, um... In evolutionary psychology and evolutionary theory in general, I, I mean, uh, we predict variability. So uh, there is variability among individuals. But, but uh, uh, before that, I would like to talk a little bit about cultural variability. Because now and then people look at different cultures and they say, oh, but uh, in appearance, they have all these tons of differences. But, but, but then again, uh, according to evolutionary psychology, people evolved the same cognitive modules because they had to deal with identical, they had to solve identical problems during the evolutionary timeline. But, but then again, uh, they, these modules don't determine behavior. So uh, in different environments, they can be tuned in different ways, right? Right, right. They're, they're, they, they ought not to provide. They ought not to produce the same behavior in all environments, because their purpose is to produce different behavior in different environments. Their purpose is to use information to generate behavior in ways that would have been, on average, adaptive under ancestral circumstances. So it would be very strange if people were behaving exactly the same way in all possible circumstances. Um, the, the mechanisms that you expect to be universal are ones with that you you can always describe something in ways that capture uh, regularities or in ways that capture differences. So I could say, well, everybody's eyes are different because this person has blue eyes and I have brown eyes and and you know my daughter has hazel eyes and look even among people with hazel eyes. There are speckles here and this eye, and there's not speckles in this eye. Okay, but they're all eyes. They all have the same functional design. There's a cornea in all of them. There's an iris. There's there, there, there's there's all of these things that are the same across them. And so, to some extent, whether you focus on variability or um, regularities, it's almost an aesthetic preference. But you don't. But it's not so helpful if you're focusing only on the variability. It's not so helpful because the variability um, is variability within a universal design. Now, the part that's that you expect to be universal are the, is, is the functional design. You know, like my stomach. The functional design of stomachs is the same, connected, you know, to the esophagus at one end to the small intestines at the other end, has an acid bath in the middle. But the, the, the exact shape of the stomach. It can vary a lot. It doesn't matter. And the exact amount of acid can vary a lot. And, and it can vary for all kinds of reasons. What you're eating, there can be genetic variation, random variation that affects things like that, and so on. Um, but the complex functional design, anything that's coded for by a suite of, of genes that have to work together to produce... Um, that, that anything with a complex functional design where a suite of genes has to work together to produce the outcome, that you expect the genetic basis for that to be universal. Um, uh, because otherwise, so if you think about men and women and humans, um, you have every gene necessary to have ovaries, a uterus, breasts, everything. I mean, you. Uh, I have everything I need to have testes, to, to have a beard, all of these things, um, except for one, except for, you know, the, the antigen on the Y chromosome, okay? What, so the, the, the genetic basis for all of those complex adaptations that go into being female versus going into being male, 
those adaptations, the genetic basis for them is universal. We all have it. What differs is where whether it, that that you have a, a, a gene that turns on and off, a whole a whole suites of other genes that turn you into a male, and I don't have that switch. Um, it needs to be designed that way because imagine that if it was designed differently. Imagine that I had all the genes for having a female reproductive system, and you had all the genes for having a male reproductive system, and then there's sexual recombination where chromosomes are being randomly uh, there's a uh, randomly chosen and put together to produce an offspring. The offspring is not going to have all the parts necessary to be either one or the other. It's going to be some sort of non-functional intermediate form. This is why you find this. You find this like in ants for and bees, for example, where you have different morphs. So you have queens and and workers and soldiers, depending on the species. They they look very different and they behave very differently. But that's they all have the genes for being any one of those things. It depends on what they're fed as larva. So, you know, queens are fed something called royal jelly, and that turns the larva into a queen. But that queen has all the genes for being a worker or a soldier, and vice versa for the workers and soldiers. That, that's a complex, all of three, those three morphs, and their behavioral and physically different morphologies, the genetic basis for those three morphs is, is present in all of them. Um, and it's just which genes are turned on or off. Now, other things are freer to vary. So anything that's a matter of a sort of single gene variation or just a little quantitative variation, that that can vary uh, across places and time much more easily. So a really good example of this is, um, you know, I'm lactose intolerant. And, you know, I'm of Greek descent, and most people on Earth are lactose intolerant. People descended from Northern Europeans uh, are much more tolerant to lactose, milk sugar. Um, we're mammals. We all are able to digest milk as infants because we're mammals. <laughs> that's, that's a defining, <laughs> it's a defining feature of mammals that offspring are nursed with milk by their mothers. Um, uh, but, you know, for most humans on most parts of the planet, there's, uh, th th there's not milk available when they're older, right? To have milk available when you're older and to have it with the sugar, you need two things. One is you need to be having uh, animals available like cows or, you know, some goats, something that you can milk. Uh, and But in most parts of the world where there's no, it's not cold enough or there's no refrigeration, um, the milk sugar, the lactose, is going to be eaten by bacteria. And so in lots of parts of the world, yes, even if they have have milk as adults, it's sour milk products like yogurt or cheese. They're sour because the sugar has been eaten by bacteria. So the, the bacteria are winning, right? Because <laughs> they're getting a bunch of the energy from that milk. In, 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 in Northern Europe, people could both keep an, animals from milk and it was cold enough that they could have access to the milk and, and keep it for a while uh, with the milk sugar in it without the bacteria getting it first. So, so think about the lactase gene, uh, the, the gene for the enzyme lactase. That's the enzyme that breaks apart the milk sugar. That gene is very has a very complex design. It's a very... It's a piece of nano machinery. It has a very intricate structure to be able to break down milk sugar. We all have the lactase gene, even me. <laughs> um, but and and it's turned on and it's it's produced that gene that 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 the lactase the enzyme is produced when we're infants. But um, in most people, its production is ramped down when they become teenagers or adults because they're. they're it's now useless. Why would I put metabolic energy into producing an enzyme that is not going to help me? That's not useful because I'm not. I don't have access to milk anymore. Um, in people in Northern Europe, that, it, that, that there were there were some genetic changes so that that enzyme stayed active, so that you kept producing the enzyme into adulthood. That's that's quantitative variation. So what I'm trying to distinguish is is. Is very is, is the genetic basis of a of a complex machine that has many parts and requires the fixation of many different alleles, which would be having the gene for producing lactase the lactase enzyme at all, versus quantitative variation, which 
can push around something like, well, does it stay active for how long? Uh, how long of your life does it stay activated? That can and, and does vary sometimes from population to population. So sometimes there are little tweaky genetic, quantitative genetic changes like that. Um, that's not impossible. The thing that's really not possible that would be very difficult would be if some people had the genetic basis for the lactase gene and other people lack the genetic basis for that gene at all because of sexual recombination, because we reproduce sexually with this weird, random jamming together of two people's genomes. That, that's the part that, that, that's why a lot of people don't, un, uh, don't understand that when John and I are arguing for the genetic basis of, co of certain complex map adaptations being universal, it's not because we think the environments were always the same, it's because it's, it's, a, it's a logical consequence of the fact that we reproduce sexually instead of cloning. Because it's a, it's a, it's 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 an engineering it's a feature of the engineering of sexual reproduction that you have to have the genetic basis be uh, common to everybody for the complex functional design, or else it'll get ripped apart. Yeah, exactly. And and I would say that what people have to have in mind when they think about evolutionary psychology and to think along those lines, because if you're a stupid person like me who reads an article you wrote some time ago about how men with bigger upper body strength tend to be more supportive of military action than what I, what I think, oh great, so that means that if I start manifesting myself for all military actions around the world, then I will be able to lure women into believing that's a proxy for my upper body strength and that I'm not really a, just a liberal wimp. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I, I should have known better. Yeah. Okay. okay, so um, uh, another question. Uh, how would modules... Uh, be represented physically? That is to say, w would they correspond to neural, uh, neural networks or something like that? Well, they don't have to be physically localized. So they don't have to be um, in, you don't, you don't have to have, a, the, a mechanism can be composed of connections that are in many parts of the brain. Think about, you're probably too young to remember old fashioned phones, telephones. Um, before they had, you know, chips in them and so forth. But when I was a child, there were telephones that were sort of like, they're sort of like boxes. And if you took off the cover, you saw all kinds of wires inside. Of the, of the, and the wires are, are hooked up to each other in a particular way so that the telephone works. Right? But when you shove it back into that box, a particular connection might be at this part of the box or that part of the box or some other part of the box. And where exactly it it is within that box is not so important as how the wires are connected to one another. Um, uh, so that's so so yes, there's going to be some neural instantiation of any any mechanism, but it doesn't have to be necessarily here versus here. I mean, there may be constraints so that it will be on average like that, but. Um, it doesn't have to be physically localized. The connections can be spread out. Um, and, uh, and also, they're going to be, each mechanism is going to be using outputs from lots of other mechanisms. So you're going to see this. So it's not, it's not a phrenological claim. <laughs> it's not a claim about phrenology, okay? Um, we're talking about something that's functionally isolable whether it's in one particular physical location or or another or more spread out um, so but when it comes to the physical how physically a functionally specialized mechanism like cheater detection is represented I have no idea <laughs> that, that's the sort of thing that a neuroscientist would have to figure out and they'd have to figure it out they would only figure that out if they knew that there was such a thing as a cheater detection mechanism. If they don't know that there's a mechanism designed for detecting cheaters, they're never going to look for its physical location or manifestation, right? 
um, they may they may not even trip over it in neuropsychological in patients with brain damage. They may not trip over it even because they don't know to look for it. Um, they might know that well, this person had brain damage and they're behaving oddly, but it wouldn't necessarily occur to you that they might be behaving oddly because there's something very specific that's happened to a particular mechanism for detecting cheaters, for example. It's one of these things where to go looking for the physical basis of something, you have to know it exists. And so people know the visual system exists and they look for the physical basis of the visual system. There are certain things they know exist, but a lot of the things that we've been studying, you're not going to look unless you, unless somebody said, hey, you know, it looks like there's a mechanism specialized for this. Where is it and how does it work? Um, it became clear to me years and years ago that I ought not to be the person who figures out um, things about neurons and hormones. I don't think I have any talent at that whatsoever. <laughs> um, and so I, I leave those questions to the people who are much better equipped <laughs> to answer them uh, you know, than me. I mean, what a, what a really honest neuroscientist will tell you is that this question about how exactly neurons process information about anything, they don't know exactly. I mean, they know that they do. They know that disrupting their operation will change behavior, but it's one of the how to go from a, a, how to go from a description, a, a neural description in terms of receptors and connections between neurons to a computational description is a bit unclear to everybody at this moment. You know, hopefully it'll become clearer and clearer over time. But So that's a long way of telling you, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, fair enough. So, um, and now this is sort of a philosophical question but related to evolutionary psychology. So if we have these evolved adaptations and they served us to deal with the world outside, let's say. So e e even if they don't process uh, all the time information in a precisely accurate manner, uh, don't they still refer to something that is true in the sense that it corresponds to, s to something real? Can you say that? Again, slightly differently. I I, 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 I apologize because I, yeah, 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 it's, uh, I started yeah, it's, I, I, as you were talking. I, I started to worry about something different, and and then I lost a key part of what you were saying. You you, you were saying that so, my, so my, my the, mechanism. Go, go ahead. We we have these evolved adaptations, right? The modules and things like that. So and and they served us in in dealing with the world. So, <laughs> The world yes. around us. So yes. e even if they don't always process information in in a precisely accurate manner, uh, don't they still refer to something that should that we could consider to be true, even if only in the sense of it being real? Um, uh, you can have selection for mechanisms that that represent the world in a way that's not true if it's useful, if it was useful. So, um, so for example, uh, it, I might, let's yeah, say I'm... And, and, and per perhaps just to make it a bit easier, because uh, the, this comes from an idea that, that uh, has been in the, somewhat in the media recently, in the media, in the YouTube media, let's say recently, uh, I don't know if you know about uh, Brett, Brett Weinstein. I don't know. Uh, I, I, don't, the, I, I don't know the, if I know. You would have to tell me more. Um, okay. uh, that, that professor that had that issue at Evergreen State University. Oh, he was the one that was told that he can't come onto campus? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know a little bit about that. Oh, okay, okay, think. okay. But one of the ideas he has, is, and he's an evolutionary biologist, is that we could differentiate between uh, li literal truth, that is what we discover through science, let's say, about the world, uh, and then metaphorical truth that, is, that he 
he defines as being something that would uh, the that would have been useful or that, or that can be can still be useful for us nowadays that doesn't really correspond to something literally true but but like, he, but, like, he, like, but, but like, he calls the, he calls them he calls it metaphorical truth well the some would argue Dan Dennett has argued that the theory of mind mechanism is like that. Dan Dennett has argued that we may represent behavior as caused by beliefs and desires, but there's no such thing in the head that corresponds to a belief and a desire. There's no such that 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 that's a convenient way of speaking, but doesn't describe the way that the information processing system really works. Um, I'm agnostic about that particular thing, but but, but that particular example, um, but. That would be an example. So he would say, if you're playing if you're playing chess with a computer program, it's very useful to think of the computer program as knowing the rules of chess and that it's trying to win, and that'll allow you to predict its moves. And but he says, but look, what particular computations are being done by that program? You have no idea what those are, but it's still a very useful way of thinking about the computer program. There may be lots of programs in our heads that are like that. Um, and I don't know if I want to call them metaphorically true or not metaphorically true, um, but there are a lot of programs in our heads that are going to do things that are super useful. And they may not always be useful in a modern environment, but so for example, um, you know, if, 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 if you are a hunter-gatherer in African savannas, there's, you know, there are there are there are predatory cats that live in trees. Leopards live in trees, right? And probably there's no leopard in that tree over there. Um, but you know, I could walk a little bit around the tree and 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 and, and not be in danger of being left on by a leopard. Or I could walk right under the low branches of the tree and be in danger of being left on by a leopard. But the probability is very high that there is no leopard, right? So, but I still might feel a little bit uneasy going underneath that tree. Um, and that uneasiness can be the product of an adaptation that was designed by selection because we have to, we have to adjust the costs and benefits of various actions with the probability to make decisions that don't end up killing us. So it only has to be a leopard in that tree once for me to become leopard food. Um, so if the cost of my going a few feet around it is small, why not go around it? There are lots of things that 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 I do at least, um, knowing that the probability of something bad happening is incredibly small. Um, that the, the, the the sane part of me will know that, but still, um, other parts of me uh, will want to, if the cost is small enough, not not take the risk. Um, that's, I don't know if you want to call adjusting your signal detection threshold uh, metaphorically true or 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 metaphorically or an act actually false. But see, if you think about it, the behavior is not just a function of Let's say that you have a perfectly designed Bayesian machine in your head. And let's say that that machine is estimating probabilities excellently, probabilities of different events. It has a, let's say it has a very accurate estimation of the probability of various events, including ones that might be lethal. Your actual behavior will not be a function only of that, because there's, there's the costs of different errors there's a cost of, of a false alarm, you know, where I, I'm worried that something's going to happen that's probably not going to happen. And there's a cost of a miss where I thought something was going to not happen and it does happen. Something bad happens that I do, that, that something bad happens that I did not anticipate. And so the behavior that I manifest is going to be a function of both my accurate representation of the world, if I have a mechanism that's doing it, and the estimation of the costs of the two kinds of errors that I can make, the false alarms and the, and the misses.
Apparently, I just saw, uh, you know that Uber self-driving car in Arizona that that horribly ran over a woman um, yeah. there? I, ju I just saw uh, uh, the claim that, that actually there was uh, an issue in its software, that its software, that, that the car did detect the woman, um, but it was classified as a false positive. Um, some, sometimes, uh, you know, a, a, a machine will detect something, but the thing's not actually there. Um, and, and it decided to classify the input as a false positive, that there really wasn't a person there. And that's why it didn't take um, action to avoid hitting her. Um, where you set that threshold on, <laughs> is this a false positive or is this an actual case of a human being on the road, that's going to be really important uh, to the software. Is it a bug or not a bug in the software? Well, it kind of depends on on how on how cautious you. It depends on the costs and the benefits of the behavior, right? Because you don't want every large insect that flies by to be categorized as a person in the road, so that the cars are just stopping randomly as insects are flying by or as a bird flutters by. Um, on the one hand, so it does have to decide that some things are false positives. On the other hand, you really don't want it hitting people. Um, and that's a signal detection problem of where you're gonna set your, your threshold. Uh, natural selection's done that for us for lots of mechanisms. And we have evolved prior probabilities in lots of our mechanisms of different kinds of events, which are then calibrated by the particular environment we find ourselves in, you know? Santa Barbara is, you know, leopard free. As far as I know, there are no leopards in Santa Barbara. And I'm sure I walk under many more trees in, in Santa Barbara than your typical person living in the middle of um, East Africa uh, does. Um, uh, so yeah, our, our behavior, you brought up the cross-cultural variation issue earlier. Cross-cultural variations can be caused by a lot of different things. Uh, mechanisms that are calibrated to different environments by the experiences that we have, the different kinds of knowledge that we build from particular experiences. It can also, you can also find patterns of uh, variation that come because we have alternative programs that are activated by cues. So here, here's a concrete example that has to do with sharing uh, and, and fairness in sharing. Um, when hunter-gatherers when, there's, when they're foraging and there's high variance due to bad luck, like in hunting, people will come back with nothing a lot of the time. Um, when there's high variance to, due to bad luck, they pool the risk. So you come back with uh, an antelope today from a hunt and I came back with nothing. You share that with me today. And then when there's a reversal of fortune on a different day and you come back with nothing and I come back with something, I share it with you. We, we store the food in the form of a social obligation. We pool the risk, um, and so with things that, with things where the outcome, where bad luck can play a large role, people have the spontaneous impulse to share share widely. Um, when variance is low, and due to how much effort we put in, you know, like I spent hours digging for those tubers, and you were when you were off laying in the sun. Um, we don't have such a big impulse to share those things. We tend to share those through specific reciprocation relationships um, or just with our families. So that's a case where you'll have different patterns of sharing, even within a society for different kinds of goods, but also you'll see different patterns across societies depending on how much people experience outcomes is due to bad luck versus insufficient effort. So, you know, the, the, the bad luck, um, the bad luck situation activates uh, sharing rules that are more like Marx's from each according to his ability to each according to his needs kind of sharing, right? But the low effort one doesn't activate that same set of sharing rules. So this is another source of a variation between domains or between resources within a culture, but also it can be across cultures, um, depending on how, mu how, how much your life is determined by awful luck. Um, we, 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 we live in, um, you know, we live right now in a market economy where, I mean, both still play a role, um, but some of the role, it's not as precarious as 
you know, if you're a hunter gatherer and you're coming back with nothing 60% of the time, which is, that's not uncommon in hunter gatherers to come back with no meat 60% of the time. That's a lot of outcomes due to bad luck. So that's a case where you have alternative programs that govern sharing, but they're activated by cues, for the perception of outcomes due to luck versus effort. Um, you can... Yeah, yeah, and, and so, sorry to interrupt you there, but th there was this study, I, I can't remember the name of the authors now, but they compared uh, the attitudes people have in, in the US and I think people from Sweden toward the Denmark. Home, uh, homeless Denmark. Oh, oh, okay, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, that's, that's when, one of my colleagues, when, yeah. This is yeah. Michael Bang-Peterson. Ma Michael Bang-Peterson is a, a political scientist at Aarhus in Denmark. And yes, he, he turned Danes into Americans and Americans into Danes. What, 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 what he did was, um, you know, it, you've got the Danish welfare state and you've got the U.S., which is less so. Uh, and, and typically, if you ask about support for, um, for social welfare, um, redistribution for social welfare, typically there's more support in Denmark than there is in the U.S. for it. Um, but he points out that also the stereotype that people have in both places of your typical welfare recipient is different. In Denmark, the stereotype is more uh, that the person's on welfare due to temporary bad luck, uh, whereas in the U.S. It's, it's more that the person wasn't trying, wasn't making an effort. So what he did was, to, to, to test that hypothesis, he, he, he created little situations. So he said to people, uh, imagine um, a man who's on social welfare. He's worked hard his whole life. He's always had a, a, a job that he's worked hard at. He um, was injured on his most recent job, and so he's been on social welfare, but he's very anxious to get back to work. And they ask for, about the, your support for social welfare for that man. Danes and Americans are identical. They both are like the idea of social welfare for this man. If on the other hand you say, imagine a man, he's never really had a steady job and he really doesn't really, really want one. Um, he's on social welfare now because he hasn't really looked and he doesn't have a, much interest in finding a job. And then you ask about how in favor of social welfare are you for this man. Both, both have lower, uh, are, are much less in favor of social welfare for this man than for the other man, and there's no difference between the U.S. and Denmark. And so what, what Michael's argument is, is that, um, that what you're seeing as the cultural difference is a difference in your default assumptions about how likely the person is to be in need because of bad luck versus effort. But when you create, the, when you set the situation and you provide the information about why that person is in that situation, then the cultural difference goes away between the two places. Um, so that, that's, a, that's an example exactly of what I'm, I'm talking about. John and I called, called this a long time ago, evoked culture, that you can have lots of reasons for all culture, culture is just a, culture is just a word that refers to within group similarities and between group differences. And those patterns of similarities and differences can have many different causes. Um, it can be, as you were saying, the particulars of the environment that you're living in, um, uh, how it calibrates particular mechanisms in your head. It can be perceptions of luck versus effort, turning on or off different programs in your head. It can also, of course, there's, there, it, there can be elements of cultural transmission, like when we were talking about the spread of religious ideas, supernatural ideas with Pascal Boye's work. Obviously, there's cultural transmission. It's not false that there's cultural, there's cultural transmission uh, from person to person, and some ideas are very contagious and some ideas not so much. Um, but part of understanding what ideas spread easily from mind to mind and which ones don't, part of that explanation is what kinds of mechanisms are in our heads, that some ideas are very easy to understand and interesting and spread easily. Other ideas are much harder to, to understand and they, they stay limited to, so quantum mechanics, hard to understand stays limited to specialists who work on it. I mean, people know that it exists, but most people would not be able to explain it. Um, other ideas can much more easily spread from mind to mind. Um, so part of modeling cultural evolution is going to be, I'm not that fond of the term cultural evolution, because it seems to me often people are talking about history. Um, but, but part of modeling 
cultural change um, is going to be require understanding how the mind was designed. But that's not the only thing. There are things that happen that you can't understand only with individual minds. Right? I mean, in economics, the law of supply and demand and how that sets prices. That doesn't reduce to an individual mind. It's something that emer it, that that's an that's an actual emergent property of many people exchanging. And lots of people talk about emergent properties, and sometimes I don't know what they're talking about. But that's a case where there really is an emergent property when you have many people engaged in exchange with people they don't know, and um, and it's a real outcome of of decisions in aggregate by suppliers and people who want to buy the things that they supply. Um, what kind of institutions that, what kinds of institutions people like to live under or not is also going to depend some about on properties of the human mind. It's also going to depend on what some of my colleagues call the epidemiology of representations. Um, what, what, what epidemiological properties of, of, of a given group of people. What are what are the other things going on in that group of people that will make certain kinds of institutions more stable and, and others? And there are people who work on things like that, and, and it's very interesting. I, I just I, my hope is that there's many more things in the future that where when people are trying to model that that they're bringing together that with with uh, models of the evolved psychology, insofar as we know them. Mm -hmm. So yes, all of those things contribute to cultural differences. All of them, all of them, all the time. Yeah, uh, and because our evolved psychology is at the basis of our human culture, would you say that perhaps one of the reasons why stereotypes are at least sometimes part partially true is is because they can also occur as an emergent property uh, of, uh, of of people interacting with each other and because they share the the same underlying psychological mechanisms uh, yeah they, they, they can it can I mean sometimes I mean it a stereotype is basically an inference made based on membership in a category so I have a stereotype the vegetables is green. Um, uh, but the fact that I have a stereotype of vegetables is green doesn't mean I don't know carrots are orange and, and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, we're gonna have all kinds of stereotypes of, of, of different people and of different cultures and, and so forth that are gonna be, you know, estimates of what's likely to be true when we don't have further information. When people get further information, usually they go with the the, the further information, um, because why would I use out-of-date information about somebody when I know them and I see how they really are? Um, so, so, so yeah, I mean, um, yes, absolutely. Uh, there's going to be the tendency to form categories is everywhere in everybody. And so is the ability to differentiate members of those categories. I, I personally, I, um, yeah, just, people may differ in how easily they let go of certain category-based information versus individuating information. So some people might very quickly change their mind when they get to know one or two people from a, a group that they're not that familiar with. Other people might take more time. That's a question for the social psychologists uh, who study those things. If you appreciate my work, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the dissenter. Thank you.